Okay, is everybody excited? Yes. Who isn't excited? Raise your hand. <laughs> Welcome once again to be with some wild and crazy people. And for those, how many of you are here for the first time? Raise your hands. Okay. Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome. To give you a, a, a thumbnail introduction, I would just like to tell you a little about the speakers who are going to be here in general. A third of them are dedicated, top-notch, world-renowned scientists. A third of them are amateurs who truth can also leak through. And a third of them are from other planets. <laughs> And I won't tell you who's who, but we can talk about it during the breaks. But just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Craig Marshall, and uh, I'm having a little bit of an identity crisis. And I'm gonna be talking to you about this, maybe you can help me out. And it started right here. How many of you know where, where, what this building is? Anybody? This is Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California. And this is a little, chapel, a memorial chapel, called the Church of the Recessional. And I went to a funeral of a family friend when I was 10 years old in this chapel. And at that time, that started my quest. What's it all about, Alfie? Trying to see the big picture, understanding who I was in the grand scheme of things. So I've been a searcher my whole life. I, I hit the ground kind of a cynic, as you can see. <laughs> When I was four years old, the photographer said, smile, and that's all I could give him, you know? <laughs> really, I was skeptical about life, my whole life. Even though I, I played Little League Baseball and was in the YMCA and got decent grades in school and all of that, I stumbled into acting when I was about 10 years old, and for 10 years I sold your parents Kellogg's Corn Flakes and Coca-Cola and a lot of rubbish, you know? But anyway, when I was 23 years old, when I graduated from college, I became a monk with Self-Realization Fellowship. And of course, to you, many of you know about Yogananda through speakers who've referenced him, and we had a class yesterday in the Holy Science. So I lived in the SRF ashrams for 35 years and learned a tremendous amount, had wonderful mentorship. And one of the people that uh, I was pretty close to toward the end of his life was Steve Jobs. And he called up Self-Realization Fellowship and said, hi, this is Steve Jobs, and the operator didn't believe him. So anyway, the phone call ended up in my office and he was trying to get uh, the autobiography of a yogi on iTunes. And of course, you know the story at his memorial service that he gave out a copy of the autobiography of a yogi to all the people who came. So there are these people. And this is at a memorial service I gave for George Harrison. George Harrison was an amazing person. And I think he influenced a lot of people on a lot of different levels. And I gave two memorials for him, one at his home in, in England and one here at the Self-Realization Lake Shrine. And during that ceremony, I said, you know, SRF is really sad to see George go because he was one of our top salesmen. He gave away thousands of copies of Autobiography of a Yogi, you know? So afterwards, I didn't know it, but I walked out of the chapel and there was one of his family members ha handing an autobiography to everybody who came out of the chapel. And this very famous record producer got a book as he was coming through the line and he, and he whispered in my ear, he says, this is the fourth time George has given me the book. I'm finally gonna read the damn thing. <laughs> Truth is all around us. And how many of you read the book Future Shock? If you haven't read it, it's an old book, but it's very timely now. It was published in 1970, and Alvin Toffler was making all these predictions about what was going to be happening 50 years from then, which is next year. And he talked about overchoice and the incredible challenges we would be under, and all of it is spot on. But the quote that means the most to me is this, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot do three things, learn, unlearn, and relearn. And isn't that what we're all here to do? Isn't it exciting? But we have to unlearn a little bit to make some disk space, right? You know, to question our beliefs. I think it's the healthiest thing. And since I was a monk, I've been lecturing around the world on mindfulness in business. And there is so much stress, there is so much confusion that I've started a company, and it's called The Seven Mindful Habits. 
it's so exciting to see how hungry people are. And mindfulness is a word is, is catching on. This picture here is like a quarterly publication by Time magazine. They sell it in the grocery stores. It's $17 a magazine, you know? And yet they're selling like hotcakes. There's mindfulness 2.0, mindfulness for moms, mindfulness for teenagers. Everybody's getting on the bandwagon with that word, which is fine. But what I discovered was I studied a research project that was done by the Carnegie Institute a number of years ago, and they were talking about success, primarily in business. They said there's three components, skills, knowledge, and attitude. But the, but the bomb in their research was that attitude represented 85% of it, doesn't it? Because anybody can learn anything. But how do you have that twinkle in your eye? How do you have that openness? And now I work with a major conglomerate, multi-billion dollar company, I won't name the name, but their teams are old. All of them are 60 or 70 year old people, and you know why? They're scared to death of the millennials. They don't want them around because they're asking questions, they're rocking the boat, you know, they're, they're, they're strategic termites. But it's all moving. So I talk to people on the most basic level, and I said, you know what a thought is? You look up the definition of thought in the dictionary, it's gobbledygook, it's absolutely worthless. And where do thoughts come from? They're like champagne bubbles. We don't invite thoughts, they just come, right? And the yogis say that we think about a thousand thoughts an hour. That's a thought every two and two thirds seconds. Thought, one Mississippi, two Mississippi. Thought, one Mississippi, two Mississippi. Thought, that's the tempo of thoughts. It's amazing. So we have to make decisions, which every one of those. Are we gonna write it down? Are we gonna act on it? Are we gonna dismiss it? Are we gonna share it with somebody? Because in two and two thirds seconds, there's another one coming down the pike, you know? It's amazing, isn't it? Thoughts. What is a feeling? We don't know these things. It's not part of our education. And so, how do thoughts become things? I think this is the science of this era. How do our thoughts, what is the creative process? And you're gonna hear some really cutting edge people talk about it. In all of the talks I give to these hardcore, triple A personalities, they all wanna to learn to meditate and they all say the same thing, I can't meditate. My mind goes too fast. I just can't turn off the bubble machine. And I go, I know, I understand. The yogis thousands of years ago discovered absolutely that the mind cannot control the mind. Isn't that a humbling thought? <laughs> so that's why they got into the study of the breath and the relationship between the breath and the mind. Because as you watch the breath, it will slow down, right? And think about it, what happens when the breath slows down? And of course the heart rate slows down, the thoughts slow down, and even with the breath, as you slow it down, what happens is there's a little pause between inhalation and exhalation and another little pause between inhalation and exhalation, right? Those pauses enlarge. And that is the first manifestation of the creative process, which is called peace. Then comes love and then comes joy. These are the feeling side of it all. But you know, I work with products like New Calm, things like this that are jump starts for meditation. There is technology, not only methodology now. So there's lots to look forward to. And then I hang out with my wife, Karina, and Zoe, who you met. She registered all of you. Everybody knows Zoe. So I have a very balanced life, but I still have this little identity crisis going on. And I'm kind of an Egyptian. I used to work in Egypt. I've been there a number of times. I'm always so excited, and some of the pictures we're gonna see and the breakthrough disclosures that you're gonna hear are wild. And I was just there a few weeks ago. It was my fifth trip. And look at that. When you see, when you see reliefs like this, even though you don't understand what they mean, they're still doing their thing. They're still influencing us symbologically. You know, there is, it's more than metaphor. It's like, what do these devices mean? And we're gonna be hearing about this. So anyway, I just want you all to pay attention, relax, take your notes, don't be shy to ask questions, shake down the speakers during the break. Everybody's very open, everybody's excited to be here. And, and if you wanna to write to me, I'm Craig at sevenmindfulhabits.com, happy to answer any questions and follow through. So also approach me during the breaks and ask me any questions that might help me with my identity crisis because I was a monk for 35 years, I wore a shirt like this, now I'm a happily married guy. I'm, I'm kind of an Egyptian throughout it all. I've always been sort of an adventurer and pushing the envelope. So I thought, you know, well, what could I wear 
that would be reflective, because I don't want to be a monk or a merry guy. I don't want to be this or that. I want to combine them all together. Doesn't that sound real? You know, I'm tired of this or that. So I bought a hat the other day that kind of reflects uh, the new me of this combination that I'm talking about. And I want your opinion to decide whether to keep it or take it back. What do you think? And I can tell you where to get them, too. It's not far. So welcome to CPAC. I want to introduce Walter. Walter Cruttenden is one of my heroes because he is a cutting edge guy. He is a dynamic doer, and yet he's into the being. He's a grounded fellow. He's a great friend. And Walter, come up here and do your thing. Amen. <laughs>